Well, I was going to bring a mirror up here today and forgot to track one down before the service. Some of you ladies probably have one in your purse, so you've got it all the time. For me, I don't need that. My hair doesn't get out of place very often. But I did need a mirror earlier this week, and it did have to do with my hair. So I took the girls, the older girls, to the pool for the first time this summer, and Courtney had gotten this new sunscreen. And some of you, again, you don't understand this, but for a guy like me, we need sunscreen on the top of our head. And the sunscreen was really sticky stuff. And so even after I swam, even after I took a shower, I still had this white sunscreen on my head. It kind of made it look like the hair that I do have was prematurely turning gray. And so I, I saw this in the mirror, and I thought, you know, I, can, I could try to scrape this stuff off, but you know what, I'm just going to leave it and hope it kind of goes away. But that didn't work. <laughs> right before I took a shower last night, Courtney said, you need to scrape your head. You still got some of that on your head. <laughs> so hopefully I got it all now. But my head didn't get sunburned. A mirror is a really useful thing, isn't it? You look at it and it reflects what you look like. It shows you what you actually look like. And there's not really any arguing with a mirror. I could have looked at that mirror and I could have said, you know what, it looks like I've got sunscreen on my head, but I'm sure the mirror's not right. I, I'm just, I'm going to ignore it. I'm sure I really don't have sunscreen on my head. But that would be silly, wouldn't it? We know that a mirror, it doesn't play tricks on us. It just reflects what actually is. And our text today compares God's word to a mirror. It reflects who we actually are. Now, a while ago on the show Shark Tank, do any of you watch that show, Shark Tank? Well, if you're not familiar with it, basically entrepreneurs who have come up with an invention or have come up with a business come and they appear before some really wealthy, successful business people. And they give them a pitch and try to show why their product and their business is so great. And then they hope that these wealthy people will invest in their business and help them with their business. And a while ago, someone came and she had invented this skinny mirror. And mirrors like this have been around for a while, but she was trying to market it to stores and other places. And it was a mirror that made you look a little bit slimmer than you actually are. And most of the judges, most of those business people, really didn't like this product. They felt like it was deceptive. They said, what good is a mirror if it's not really showing what you look like? You're lying to yourself. But we tend to lie to ourselves, don't we? We want something that will tell us that we're better than we actually are. But we want something that will make us feel good about ourselves. But whether it's our appearance or whether it's our behavior, how we live our lives, we want to think the best of ourselves. And so because we don't tend to be honest about who we really are, we need a mirror that will reflect to us who we really are. Paul David Tripp is an author who describes it this way. He says, we don't see ourselves with clarity, but we think we do. We don't know ourselves with accuracy, but we are convinced we do. This is why we all tend to be offended when someone points out a sin, weakness, or failure. At the moment when we hear such an assessment, we struggle with the fact that what that person has said is so fundamentally different from the view of ourselves that we have been carrying around. So he's saying because we're not honest about who we really are, we end up getting really defensive if someone points out something wrong about us. Any of you been defensive before? You guys are not telling the truth in church. <laughs> But we all get defensive, don't we? Because we always think that that couldn't be true about us. I'm a pretty good person. That, that person is telling lies about me. But oftentimes, when someone says those things, there's more truth to it than we would like to think. And so God's word serves the purpose of reflecting who we are so that we can see who we are in honesty and then deal with it from there. So let's look at those verses from the text 
verses 23 and 24 for now. And just a reminder that the text is printed on the back of your bulletin, if you want to reference it that way. It says, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he looks like. So it's saying if we hear the word of God and we don't do what it says, then we're kind of like I was with the mirror. I saw this sunscreen problem I had on my head, but I walked away and chose to forget about it rather than doing something about it. And it's really easy for us to come to church on a Sunday and look at the mirror of God's word and then walk away and forget about it the rest of the week. But God is calling us to look at the mirror and then make adjustments from there. But let it tell us who we really are and what problems need to be dealt with. So this text gives us an opportunity to practice looking at that mirror. The first chance it gives us to practice is looking at the issue of anger. In verse 19, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So it starts out and says, let everyone be quick to hear and slow to speak. So as we think about this command from God and we evaluate ourselves based on this command, likely you realize, you know what? I do need to be a better listener. I don't listen to people very well. Or maybe you realize, you know what? I need to stop interrupting people. I've got a real problem with interrupting people while they're speaking. But as we think about God's word as a mirror, we can't stop with just these actions. We need to realize that God's word pries deeper. It pries down to, to our motives. And so let's practice that in this situation. I may realize that I need to be a better listener. I may realize that I need to stop interrupting. But why is it that I don't listen well? Why is it that I interrupt people? For me, it's partially because I'm impatient. If you haven't noticed, I'm kind of an antsy person. That's why I wave my hands a lot and why I talk a little bit fast. And so if someone's giving me a long explanation of something, especially if they talk slow, it kills me. <laughs> and I have a tough time listening to that whole explanation. So it's impatience. And it's also selfishness because they're annoying me or they're making me uncomfortable with this long explanation. And so I'm more concerned about my comfort than about showing them the respect and love they deserve as they talk to me. It also shows pride in my heart. Because if I'm honest, I tend to think that whatever they have to say isn't going to be as smart or wise or helpful as what I have to say. And so I interrupt with what I think is so important to say. Do you see how this works? It's not just the issue of interrupting. There's heart issues behind the interruption. It goes on to say slow to anger. And this might be a good time to just say it's easy to see these things in other people, isn't it? We can look at the news and we can say, yeah, look at those rioters. But look at the anger they have and the actions they're taking because of their anger. And like the verse says, certainly their anger is not producing the righteousness of God. Good things are not coming from this. And definitely we need to look at other people's actions and we know what is right and wrong based on God's word. So we can say their behavior isn't right. But when we think of God's word as a mirror, the primary purpose isn't so much to look at those other people. No, it's to look at ourselves. That mirror is reflecting what we actually look like. And so it encourages us to receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. That meekness you could describe as humility. It's a willingness to admit, yeah, I am wrong. Yeah, that is true about me. Yes, God's word is my authority, and I'm not living up to it. That's receiving God's word with meekness. 
So as we think about anger, you might again see some actions that need to be adjusted. Maybe you just need to be less reactionary. You hear something and you experience this emotion and you react right away. And you would benefit if you would just take a step back sometimes, take a few deep breaths, and then respond. Or maybe for some of you, you realize, I need to yell less. When I am angry, I tend to yell at other people. Or maybe it's, I need to throw things less. So you see these actions that you take because of your anger. But again, what is behind your anger problem? Well, oftentimes we're angry because we're blaming other people for our problems, aren't we? I'm experiencing this trouble in my life and it's their fault and so I react in anger. Or it can even be revenge. They have treated me this way and so I'm going to treat them that way. Or it can be pride. That I'm right and they're wrong and therefore I have a right to be angry. Or again, selfishness. That life isn't going how you want it to go. And after all, I'm the most important person in the world, and so I'm angry that my needs aren't being met. And we can respond in anger because of our lack of control. Things aren't going how I want them to, and so I'm angry that I don't have control. In reality, each one of us would kind of like to be God. We would like to have control of the situations and the circumstances of our lives, but we don't. And when they don't go the way we want them to, we react in anger. And so it's a lack of trust in God's control. This text gives us a couple other opportunities to practice looking at God's word as a mirror. In verse 26, it mentions the tongue. And we're not going to focus on that today because later on in chapter 3 of James, it talks about the tongue a lot. And so we'll address that topic at that point. But then it talks about the importance of visiting widows and orphans in verse 27. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. And so we see here... Really an incredible statement. Do you want to please God? Do you want to live your life in a way that honors Him? It says visit widows and orphans. And throughout Scripture you see that God has a great concern for widows and orphans. Those people who face many other difficulties because of their circumstances. But also as we look at God's Word as a mirror, sometimes we realize that we can expand from the command there. It, it says orphans and widows in their affliction. And we can think, well, what other people around me are in affliction? What other people around me are struggling and in difficult circumstances in life? And how am I doing loving those people? And so you might think about your actions and realize, I do need to put a little bit more effort into caring for those people. But then you get to motives again. And why is it that you have a tough time looking out for widows and orphans and other people in affliction? Well, selfishness is a big reason. It interrupts my time. It might take away time I could be relaxing. I end up caring more about my needs than other people's needs. It might take my money. And so selfishness is a big reason we don't care for those people. It can also be laziness. It takes effort to be intentional about getting to know those people and about caring for those people. And I should say, as, as a congregation, we have one opportunity that it happens every month to care for people like that as we serve food at the Norfolk Rescue Mission. That's a very practical way you can get to know those people and love those people who are in need. And it can also be apathy. The truth is that we don't care about enough about those people. And so we get caught up in our own lives instead of looking out for their troubles and trying to help in their troubles. And we see here that faith has legs. If you believe something, it's going to be acted out in your life as you care for others. And it's interesting that it uses the word visit. You know, it's, it's great to give financially to ministries and support them that way. 
but sometimes it's easy to say, here's some money, now you go do the work. And as it talks about visiting, that's getting personally involved. And that's caring for people yourself rather than just hiring someone else to do it. And not to downplay giving financially. Our congregation is very generous with ministries and they need those finances. But God also calls us to get personally involved. So as we've had a few opportunities to practice looking at ourselves in the mirror of God's word, I want to focus on a phrase that's kind of an odd phrase. It's this phrase, the law of liberty. Looking at verse 25. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. And does that strike you as odd, the law of liberty? Oftentimes we think of laws as limiting our freedom. The speed limit tells me I can't go as fast as I want down the highway. It doesn't seem like liberty. It doesn't seem like freedom. So how is it that God's law is a law of liberty? Well, here's an example. It might seem like freedom uh, to eat whatever you want, uh, to eat all the candy bars and all the junk food that you want. And for a while you might enjoy that freedom, but down the road it becomes bondage. Partially because that food is actually addicting and you want more and more of it. But, but also because after eating that food for a while, your body doesn't operate how it's supposed to. And you might get overweight too. And so soon you're not able to do some of the things that you would like to be able to do. Because you thought this diet was freedom. And instead it has become bondage to you. Or the same can be said with money. It might seem like freedom to spend all the money you want and buy whatever you want. But soon as you find yourself in a whole lot of debt, that freedom isn't freedom anymore. It's bondage. And now your life is being run by your need for money in order to pay back your debt. And that's how sin works. It might seem like freedom to watch whatever you want on TV and not worry about the messages it's sending you. But soon your mind is being formed by the world instead of by God's word. Or it might seem like freedom to look at naked women on your phone or on your computer. But I have dealt with so many men who have found themselves addicted in a way that they can't get out of. And the only one who can bring healing in that situation is Jesus Christ. It's a major addiction that freedom became bondage. Or the same can be true of alcohol. It can seem like freedom to drink however much you want. But the truth is that freedom comes from not being bound to a substance and not drinking or, or drinking in moderation. Of course, those are easy ones to pick on. But we want to call those the big sins. But the same is true with what we might call little sins. It might seem like freedom to gossip about other people, to just say what's on your mind and say what you think of other people. But in the end, it's bondage because you're depending on putting other people down to make yourself feel good. Or it might seem like freedom to tell a little lie once in a while, just to get out of an uncomfortable situation. But that becomes bondage when you have to follow up that little lie with another lie and another lie to cover your tracks. Do you see how sin brings bondage? And so true freedom is found in obedience to God's commands. True freedom is found as we live as God has intended. And statistically, there are probably many people here who are dealing with addictions to pornography, who are dealing with addictions to alcohol or cigarettes or whatever it might be. And so you might say, well, if obeying the law uh, brings freedom, what about me? Because I'm already stuck. I've already got 
this addiction. I'm already in this bondage. What do I do? Or you might see a cycle of gossip and lying in your life. Or circling back, there's that anger issue. And there's many here today who have an anger problem, but you've been denying it for years. You've been blaming other people. I responded in that way because of what they did. Or you've been blaming your circumstances. I responded in that way because of the situation. But anger has caused problems for you in your life. And it's hurt the people that you love the most. And so it's left a trail of disaster behind you. And I know we come to church and we all put on our best faces. But I know for many of you, you're on your best behavior here. But at your home, your family knows a different side of you, the angry side. Or at your workplace, they know a different side of you. And so as you've looked at yourself in the mirror today, and as it's revealed how ugly you are, and how sinful you are, then you may be left feeling hopeless. Where do you turn from here after you have looked at yourself in the mirror? What do you do? And that's why we need to understand the other way that the law of God is the law of liberty. As we are confronted with the mirror of God's word, and as we see how ugly we are, how ugly our hearts are, how ugly our behavior is, that's exactly what God wants his word to accomplish. Not to leave you in your mess, but so that then you would turn to the one who is the only hope for you in your bondage to sin. So that you would turn to the cross of Christ and find a true freedom. That is the purpose of the law in scripture. To drive us to Jesus and to the gospel. And so as you contemplate your sin, we need to realize that the law doesn't just accomplish that purpose when you first believe in Christ. That I see I'm a sinner, I see I need, I need a savior, and now I believe in Jesus. No, the mirror of God's word is supposed to do that to us every day of our lives. As we read God's word, it reflects back at us who we really are. It shows us our sin. So that instead of kind of forgetting about our need for Jesus, instead we are driven desperately back to Jesus in need of his grace. And so that every day we can say, God, your word has shown me this problem in my life. Your word has shown me this sin. And God, I'm stuck. I don't know how to get rid of it. And so I need your forgiveness. And I don't want to be one of those people who looks at the mirror and walks away and forgets what I look like. No, I want to be someone who looks at the mirror and makes adjustments. And that looks at the mirror and lets it change me. But God, I'm stuck. I can't do it on my own. And so Jesus, forgive me and change my heart. I need you to change me from the inside out. And as the law accomplishes that purpose, it's the law of liberty. Because it drives us to the only place that true liberty and true freedom is found. And that's in the death and the resurrection of Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Amen.